So I've recently asked to speak at the Plant Powered Expo in London, the first event of its kind which drew 8,000 people over the course of the weekend. Now this is only my second time doing this talk, but I really felt like I got into the flow of it. It's designed for new vegans and those uh, curious about veganism, which I'll explain more at the end of the talk. My apologies if there's a bit of noise pollution during the talk, but there's some funny developments around this and I think in the end it all worked out quite well. With that, let's get into it. All right. The first question I have for everyone is probably the most important one. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Feel free to shuffle around um, if you can't. So my name is Jeremy and I've been vegan for about six years. You may already have an idea of what veganism means, but the question is do you understand what the philosophy of animal rights means and really kind of understand that? And that's what I'm going to talk about here today. And I'm going to do that by going through my personal story and experience with veganism. I'm going to go through a few cool animal stories I've had at a local sanctuary. And then I'm going to talk more about the history of veganism and animal rights specifically, as well as some commonly held beliefs that I know um, I've gone through myself. And this part of the presentation might be 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and then what I'd really like to do is open it up to a bit of a group discussion. So if you have any questions as I go through, feel free to keep those in mind because this isn't just about me and my ideas, it's about all of us. So I've been talking long enough for you to probably realize I'm not English. <laughs> I'm uh, American, I grew up in the Midwest, and in a very um, animal use heavy part of the Midwest. And it wasn't until um, when I was little that I started to have experiences with species of animals that are typically used. Um, my mom actually grew up on a farm in Iowa which is known for its cornfields. And I remember walking around the farm, and, and they um, farmed plants um, on their farm, but they also used animals. So um, with this uh, uh, experiences through my childhood, it was ingrained from an early age that animal use is completely normal, natural, and necessary. It wasn't until later that um, when, uh, when I was little and sitting around the dinner table with my sister, and she's a few years older than me, uh, and she was about 12, and she's like, you know right, Mom and Dad, I'm going to be a vegetarian. And we had all kinds of discussions around the table about you know, dolphins who were taken to um, water prisons, um, elephants, and why we should boycott animal use circuses animal testing, and I was just a kid. I mean, my, my biggest concern was which toy was going to come out next, so she definitely, went from around when I was eight years old, got me to start thinking about these things. It wasn't until much later when I visited Switzerland with my dad, and I read a book while I was there called Diet for a New America. Now this was written by John Robbins, who, if you don't know, is heir to the Baskin and Robbins um, uh, franchise that uses milk uh, uh, cows for their milk. And it's a massive business. I mean, they had an ice cream cone-shaped swimming pool. So for him to write a book about veganism was quite groundbreaking. And I just remember walking around the mountains there and looking at the cows and having the words of that book swirling around in my head. I started to view animals differently. It was at that moment I chose to be vegetarian and then pescatarian um, for a while. And this lasted for about 12 years. And I would occasionally see things come up on my feed on social media, but I'd swipe right past them about cows who are used for the milk. And why did I keep swiping past them? Because I didn't want to have to give up. Can anyone fill in the blank? Just, that was really good. I was not expecting that. So I just kept scrolling through this post until one day I was sitting in my condo in Singapore. And for some reason, I chose not to scroll past that post. It was a very short two-minute video. The thing about this video is, it wasn't graphic. There was no blood. What it did show is a mom 
spending time with her newly born male son. She was cleaning him off, and they were starting to bond for those very first moments of his life. But the story didn't um, go the way I expected. Someone came and intervened, forced the cat to stand up, and started to walk him away from his mother. They forced him into a vehicle, and all along the while, the son and the mother were looking each other in the eyes as they drifted further and further apart. Now as she saw him riding away in that vehicle, she did her best to, to stop the situation, but I think we all know how that story went. And that was the first time I really saw cows as the individuals who they are. You see, for 12 years, I supported cows being used for their milk. I didn't realize there was killing in those industries too. And that's when I chose to start living vegan. Now one of my, I'm going to perk things up a little bit because I appreciate that was a bit of a downer. One of my favorite forms of animal advocacy is visiting this place, Friend Animal Sanctuary. Has anybody been to Friend? Got one in the front here. Has anybody been to a sanctuary in general? A few? All right, so good. About half the group. That's really good. I'm glad to see that. Uh, about two years ago, we took in a group of baby turkeys, and I'm not sure exactly why, but I just could not connect with birds, be it chickens, um, turkeys, or otherwise, for a really long time. And it wasn't until these little souls came along that that changed, and they're just the most incredible little creatures. They um, will run over to you, you know, this small little ball. I'll kneel down to see them. All of a sudden, they straighten up their neck, and they about quadruple in height, and they're looking you eye to eye as you're kneeling down. And it's just it's such a cool experience. And you might see in the middle there, I connected with one of them in particular. And in the bottom left picture, this was the first time we met each other. She crawled onto my lap, I wrapped my arms around her, and she slowly drifted off to sleep. You could even see her little eyes start to flicker. Because you see, scientists um, believe that turkeys, and along with a lot of other animals, experience REM sleep, which is associated with dreaming. I don't know what turkeys dream about, but I think it's pretty cool to ponder. And in the bottom right-hand corner um, is one of the uh, moments I'll remember always from friend. Now, we've just been finishing the daily tours, you know, checking all the animals, cleaning up a lot of you-know-what, <laughs> and walking back up to the um, house. The turkeys were sitting along a fence like you might expect. However, something happened. In the back there, um, the turkey named Mr. T, not to be confused with the action figure, <laughs> He started to reach his wing around one of the female turkeys. He pulled her into him, and they sat like that for ages. I stood behind them, and I could see the sun starting to set as these two embraced each other and enjoyed the sunset together. These are just moments that stick with you for a lifetime. Now, I've got one more animal story for you today. If you haven't noticed already, I can talk about the animal for two hours straight, so I'll resist the urge to do that. The next one I'd like to introduce you to is uh, Rosie. Now, when I first started volunteering at Friend, one of the um, individuals who lives on site um, said to me, you know, Rosie's pretty special. You should go over and spend some time with her. So I took my book into the field and sat with her, and to be honest, I didn't really read much of my book because I was just so fascinated with her. This is my first proper time spending time with a cow. And over the course of about 30 to 45 minutes, we started to trust each other and form a bit of a relationship and connect. And I made sure to her, let her initiate the interaction uh, rather than me coming to her. And as we sat there together, she slowly started to lean her head over. 
she'd brush her head against me, realize she was touching me, and back away to make sure I was okay. Then she would gradually start to lay her head into my lap. And you can see where that transitioned in the middle picture here. Now, I don't know if any of you have had a cow lay their head in your lap, but they are really, really heavy. But I felt perfectly um, safe. And this happened, this isn't just a one-off experience. We spent moments like this many times. But it changed the way I view cows and other animals from that point forward. So that's a bit about me. And I would like to just take a step back here because I'm not the first one to experience these ideas. In fact, no one here is. They originated a long time ago. And to help frame that conversation, I'd like to show you a short one-minute video that's entirely non-graphic to help frame what the philosophy of animal rights is really all about. The philosophy of animal rights is on the side of reason. For it is not rational to discriminate arbitrarily. And discrimination against non-human animals is demonstrably arbitrary. The other animals humans eat, use in science, hunt, trap, and exploit in a variety of other ways have a life of their own that is of importance to them apart from their utility to us. They are not only in the world, they are aware of it and also of what happens to them. The philosophy of animal rights stands for, not against justice. We are not to violate the rights of the few so that the many might benefit. This philosophy, therefore, is a philosophy of peace, but it is a philosophy that extends the demand for peace beyond the boundaries of our species. To stand truly for peace is to stand firmly against their ruthless exploitation. So I think when we look at the um, history, there's some key things here, and so I went digging where did these ideas all begin? I found three key moments in time to me. Sorry, just one moment. I'm just going to jog over here and ask if they can turn the music down real quickly. I'll be back in 60 seconds, time me. Coming back, coming back. 57, 58, 59. 60! Alright. <laughs> Alright, uh, all right, we're good, I think. Okay, so from the philosophy perspective, I looked at three key points in history. And you might wonder, you know, when did this start? I looked back, the earliest quote I could find was from 2,500 years ago. It's from the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, and it reads, For as long as man continues to be the ruthless destroyer of lower level beings, he will never know health or peace. For as long as men massacre animals, they will kill each other. Indeed, he who sows the seeds of murder and pain cannot reap joy and love. Now fast forwarding to modern times, in the middle of the 20th century, sorry, I'm still a little bit out of breath. <laughs> um, in the middle of the 20th century, the world was at war. There was a significant chance that Nazi Germany, along with its allies, was gonna conquer the world. I mean, these are scary times. And it was during these times that Donald Watson, along with a group of co-founders, started the Vegan Society in 1944. Now, I think this was a pretty compelling statement to be made, to declare peace when the world was at war. Because the original founders, while the focus of veganism is on animals, the scope and potential benefits is much wider. You see, they saw veganism as a way to peace for us all. And to me, that kind of makes sense. If we can find a way to respect other animals, there's probably a pretty good chance we're gonna find ways to respect each other better, too. This has radical, wide-sweeping ramifications when it comes to 
sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, the list goes on. But to me, why limit the positive potential? Now, the third and final point in history I'd like to focus on today is the American rights philosopher, Tom Reagan. Now, he wrote the book for case, uh, The Case for Animal Rights in 1983. And I read this book about a year ago, and it completely reshaped the way I view these issues, and a lot of this talk is inspired by that book. Has anybody heard of Tom Reagan? A couple in the front here, that's great. That's great. How many people have heard of Peter Singer? Okay, so that's about half the group. I won't get too much into this, but there are some pretty pivotal moments in history between Singer's ideas versus Reagan's ideas that can seem on the surface to be pretty similar, but actually have some pretty dramatic, dramatic differences between utilitarianism and a rights-based approach. Now the movement has largely um, accepted Singer's uh, utilitarian philosophy. I'd love to talk more about that, but we can save that maybe for the Q&A and, and keep things at that. Now you might be saying, okay Jeremy, I've heard about these animal rights, but really, why do animals have rights? And the step-by-step -step process is that the philosophy of animal rights claims that all animals are unique individuals. They each experience life and emotions such as happiness, sadness, and fear. This gives them basic interests. Now what is a right? A right is simply a way of protecting an interest. And really when it comes to this, this issue, it's about their use violating their rights. Now you might be wondering, okay, well let's give animals rights. The key distinction here is we're talking about basic moral rights. They don't need to be given. The philosophy of animal rights says they already have them. And I'm not talking about the right for polar bears to have dancing lessons or the right for pigs to do ballet or anything like that. I'm just talking about those basic rights that we all have from birth. This is really just a matter of leaving them alone. It's also known as negative rights. Uh, and it's also that basic right to be respected because I think we'll hear people talk about the right to liberty, bodily integrity, freedom, life, all these things. To me it all boils down to this and more specifically, the right to not be needlessly bred or killed. Now I spoke a little bit about the distinction between moral and legal rights, that we don't need to give animals rights. I think we will all agree there's a, a lot of legal rights that are out there, but they're mostly to protect humans, like we're like are here. There's very little real protection of ending animal use. That's why the scope of the philosophy of animal rights is for even seeking that. Bit of the history, and some of it may start to resonate with you. This doesn't apply to me. I'm not an animal lover. I think we talk about this a lot, and I think that is a part of the discussion. However, to me, being an animal lover isn't a requirement to embrace the philosophy of animal rights. So you might say, oh, you know, surely you're a compassionate person and care about others. Also an important virtue to have. However, I don't think we necessarily need to have compassion towards animals. I don't think it's a requirement. I think at a basic level, all we have to do is have respect for their life and their rights. Now that's the philosophy of animal rights in a nutshell, which is a whole topic. Tom Reagan's book is 400 pages, but I'm gonna leave it there for the moment and talk about some common beliefs. Now I know for me, I talked a little bit about my childhood and peeling back the layers that were coming towards me. 
And I think we all have these pressures. I know I've experienced them, that society and various systems that are in place, corporate ad campaigns, with the exception of this building when we leave today, will be bombarded with. Down to our friends and our family, reinforcing these ideas of animals. And much better, like peeling back the layers of the onion, there may be a few tears as well. But you know, that's okay, and that's part of the process too. But what I'd like to do is go through a few key common beliefs that I know I've experienced, either through myself or others. Now, the first is this idea of selective empathy. When we look at cows, who do we see? I can't tell you how many people I know who have chose to be vegan because they've lost an animal companion, a dog, or a cat. And I think it's because they had an experience of that individual, or perhaps even that species. Which begs the question, does our relationship with an individual or species dictate their moral value? What's the difference between a dog and a cow? Is there any really moral difference? And we can replace these images with anyone. Now, the next topic I'd like to cover is speciesism, which a few of you may have um, come across. And I think this um, almost requirement to get to know someone, to respect them, is underpinned by our belief set, and a key part of that is speciesism, which I view as both an ideology that's reinforced by various systems of government, education, and so on, as well as from an individual level, reinforcing these day-to-day -day prejudices that I think a lot of us probably still have to an extent. We might say we're smarter than them, or we can reason, or all of these things, and the whole intelligence thing, I'm not sure if I buy in the first place anyway. I mean, there's different kinds of intelligence. I mean, I've read that cows have about 70% more in emotional intelligence than we do. You know, with orcas, there's similar stories. Besides, when does someone's intelligence or abilities dictate their moral value, or even that they matter at all? Because to me, that, that shouldn't necessarily be a requirement. Now, with that, I, I think as we go into this, we might be asking ourselves the question, is animal use necessary? Surely, you know, we're taught to get our five a day or this or that. Well, to answer that question, this is the key quote I refer to. And it's from UK Dietetics Association. However, this applies to all major medical bodies. And it states that a well-planned vegan diet can support healthy living in people of all ages. Now, people might question that well-planned part of this um, quote. All diets should be well-planned and not just vegan diets. And I just want to qualify this with I'm not a dietitian. Um, but the, I think the key thing that comes up a lot is B12. Now when it comes to B12, the key things for me are that 39% of Westerners have a B12 deficiency. Only about 1% of the population is vegan. So we're not talking about a vegan specific issue, and I don't think we should be conflating the two. B12 absorption is a complicated topic that I encourage everyone to check with your doctor about, vegan or not, and strongly consider um, supplementation over fortified foods, as well as potentially injections if you have trouble absorbing it. We can talk a whole lot more about B12 if you'd like. Now, for the numbers people out there, I'd like to go through a few key health statistics that have stood out to me. The first one is that more than 95% of Westerners don't get enough fiber. How many people have been asked where they get their protein? Yeah, <laughs> I think that was almost unanimous. We should be asking the non-vegans where they get their fiber. Next, there's no cholesterol in plants, and there's a whole body of evidence that you can check on that. As well as 70% of deaths are largely lifestyle related. And, that, and, and just one specific example of this is only 5 to 10 percent of cancers are genetic. So that's a bit of the science -y stuff. You might be saying, Jeremy, you're a murderer! What about the plants? Now, I 
think when we look at um, plant use, there are some important considerations here around uh, um, how we harvest the crops and so on. However, at a basic level, does anybody see a difference between these two? Because I know I do. On the left, we have a dog. On the right, we have a house plant. On the left, we have a brain and a central nervous system. Do we have that on the right? Besides, even if you're a plants rights activist, we should still be eating plants. Due to feed conversion ratios, it takes two to 20 times the amount of plants to filter them through other animals. So that's your answer if you run into any plants rights activists. And I think a key one that comes off a lot is that it's my personal choice. Now I think free choice is a great thing that we should all be striving for. However, the question I would ask, is it personal choice when there's a victim? Besides, when did saying something's a choice make it morally justifiable? Another thing we might often hear is that God says we can use other animals. And I'm by no means about to open up a whole religious dialogue. I don't think any of us want that. But what I would say to this is, if that was the case, why would God create these beings that can feel fear, pain, and suffering? If their main use was to be needlessly bred or killed, surely there's something else that's around that we can eat that doesn't involve a victim. Now a big topic in these days with all the developments of Extinction Rebellion is whether or not vegan is sustainable. And to me the main thing I look to is the Joseph Poor University of Oxford study, which was a robust meta-analysis of 38,700 farms. This is linked on my website by the way, so don't feel like you need to, yeah. <laughs> So 38,700 farms and 1,600 processors. And one of its key findings was that the most intensive plant farming was still more harmful to the environment than the least intensive forms of animal use. Now again, a few more stats for some of the animal lovers. Two to 28, um, we, we mentioned this before, but you know, this, due to feed conversion ratios, we use far more land, water, and so on when we filter our plants through others. Also, 91% of the Amazon destruction is due to animal use. If someone ever asks you, well, you know, cows, pigs, chickens, they're all gonna go extinct. Animal use is the leading cause of species extinction. Around 200 species a, a, a day go extinct. We might also say that veganism reduces you know, our, our, our uh, food-related carbon fr footprint by 75%. And to me, this is a really important statistic because I, I appreciate there's other things that impact the environment. How, what other things can we impact more on a day-to-day -day basis? I don't know about you, but I'd much rather go down and get some food down here than go buy an electric car or put solar panels on my roof or a lot of other things. All those all should be part of the discussion. The last one is that the UN warns that we only have 11 years to limit climate change catastrophe. Now anyone interested in the environment, I strongly encourage you to watch Cowspiracy, which is a much more robust um, cover of the topic. So we might be saying, you know, why can't we just treat them better, Jeremy? Let's take away the cages, have lush spring grass, live beautiful lives, and just one bad day. And we're gonna do it really, really nice. I'd say even if we were able to find that magic answer to solve for this, what about all the days between that day and the day, the day they would have died otherwise? What about those experiences that they would have had those days? They may not even be aware that they're going to have those experiences. I'm not aware of the experiences I'm going to have in 10 minutes down there. That doesn't mean I don't want to write to them. You might be saying, well, but, you know, veganism is just a bit too extreme. I'll, I'll consider vegetarianism, maybe. However, I'd strongly encourage you to look what happens to the male offspring when their moms are used for their milk and their eggs. Especially, has anyone seen the clip of what happens to male chicks when they're used for eggs? 
Okay, about half the group. That's probably, if you want 60 seconds to inspire you on this subject, I think that'll do it. Because basically they just um, kill the male chicks, usually within 24 to 48 hours. And I won't go into detail, but it basically equates to putting them in a blender. Or we might say, what about fashion? Using them for their skin or their hair. You know, we can't sidestep this issue either. There's nearly three million mice, rats, and other species that are tested on ruthlessly and killed every single year just here in the UK. What about animals who are oftentimes taken out of their natural environment, forced to perform in these water prisons, or elephants like you see on the right? You can't see, but there's actually a tear dripping from the elephant's eye. Is this really their purpose on this earth? The last thing I'd like to talk about here when it comes to beliefs is how many people get the criticism that vegans only care about the animals? One, okay, two, I, yeah, I suspect a few of us. I suspect a few of us. To me, our basic moral rights are our animal rights. On top of that, we can build all in all these human rights through oftentimes through legal protection and otherwise. But these two systematically reinforce each other. If we have one, it's going to naturally lead to the other. And they're part of the same discussion, which we touched on earlier, talking about the founding of the vegan society. So in closing, I've talked a bit about here today about my experiences learning about the pervasive use of animals in our society, some of the barriers that I overcame to one day realizing that animal use is completely unnecessary. So why would we choose to support their needless breeding and killing? My experience as a friend with animals there and elsewhere have shown me that all animals are unique individuals, each with their own story to tell that's totally irreplaceable. Each time when I'm at the friend and looking another animal in the eye, I can't help but ask myself the question, are they really that different to us? Maybe they're just born into different bodies. Do they not experience life in a way that's very similar to us at a basic level that gives them a valid claim to moral rights that's violated when we use them? If you haven't had these experiences with animals or see the world in this way, from the bottom of my heart, I truly hope that you one day will. Because I know that my animal advocacy is probably the best part of who I am. And this awakening, enlightenment that I've experienced is probably one of the most profound of my entire life. Therefore, the animal rights philosophy is a philosophy of peace. But it is a philosophy that extends the demand for peace beyond the boundaries of our own species. Thank you for coming here today and for helping us all explore how as individuals, we can increase the peace in this world by respecting others and their rights through veganism. Thank you. Now, we're going a bit longer than planned, um, but I, I'm just curious about your thoughts now. Is there anything I've said, and I do street outreach. I spent an hour um, with a humanist group on Tuesday, and they grilled me for an hour. And they're actually very kind. But I really like being challenged. So if there's any questions you have, or actually just experiences of your own that relate to this that you'd like to share with the group, anything that um, comes to mind that you'd like to explore maybe a little bit further. Yep, that's an excellent question. Um, the question was around um, animal companions and kind of where they lie. And I think to help frame this conversation, the focus of veganism is the food. However, the scope is much, much wider. There's all kinds of animal use that we experience. 
So I think when we're approaching these issues, I think it's important to keep in context the, the, the um, primary forms of animal use. And, but that's not to sidestep your question. I do want to answer it. <laughs> I have two vegan dogs at home. When I first chose to be vegan, I was feeding them other animals. And it actually took a bit for me to, to um, de deconstruct that form of animal use. I think a brief overview, I encourage you to look into the subject more um, on your own, but dogs are not required to use other animals or eat them. One of the longest living dogs, Bramble, lived to over 27 years old. I appreciate that's anecdotal, but that shows that it can be done. Cats are a different um, subject. I'm not a cat scientist or biologist. I'll just answer that cats are tricky, but I, I think we'll get answers across the spectrum on that, but I think the largest body of evidence is that cats really struggle on a vegan diet, but I, I don't have cats of my own, and I've only looked at it on a surface level. So, does anyone else have anything to add about their animal companion friends, possibly the impact that they've had on your life? Does anybody have a dog, cat, or other species of friend that they'd like to, to share about? Yep. of your own, I highly encourage you to do your own talks. It sounds like you honestly got some ideas and for all of us to find different ways to explore that. I think to, um, communication is a tricky thing and I think when we compound that with our family, it can be very, very tricky, especially when we're younger and we're trying to talk to someone who's older than us. I, um, the whole reason I started this group, Vegan Interactions, is because I read a book called Motivational Methods for Vegan Advocacy that really shaped the way I view communication. And I really uh, encourage you to check that out for, your own, for yourself. I think as far as common beliefs, we heard a lot of them today. To me, it's a bit like, like you're talking to someone and all of a sudden you have a really, really, really annoying itch and just trying not to scratch that itch. One thing that helps me is remembering I'm not doing this for my entertainment, I'm doing it for others, so that helps a little bit. But I think also it's taking a step back and remembering that it's not our fault that the world is damaged. We were born into this. And I think similarly, when we're encountering someone else who makes certain choices, remembering that it's not up to us to own their choices. We can do our part and help nudge them in the right direction, but that's really the, the um, most we can do. And 
leaving it there because it's not just, I don't think it just helps our interactions. I think it helps us too because I know it takes a huge weight off my shoulder to know that I'm not going to have to, you know, change the person on the spot. We can just have an open discussion. And one of my favorite questions to ask people, have you considered veganism? Bit of a trick question because if they answer that, they've just considered veganism. But generally speaking, that's get them talking about their experiences. But all of a sudden, they'll, they'll probably tell you lots of things that'll help you um, figure out where to steer the conversation. Hopefully, back to a discussion about animals and their rights. Because I think if we can focus in on them as individuals, we can really motivate people. And to me, versus a lot of stuff that may be floating out there that has its place. Talking about whether animals are individuals, to what extent they experience life, that is an interesting story, and I find it draws people in versus pushing them away. I'll leave it there, but hopefully that addresses Does that kind of address? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do a whole other talk on communication, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Is there any other thoughts? I mean, we've got time. Honestly, this is just such a unique experience to share ideas, so if there's anything else, that anyone would like to add, yes. protein, I'm still standing here, you know, those types of things. It can feel a bit monotonous hearing these things over and over. That is such a cool response to that question. I mean, I've been doing this for years and I haven't heard that. I mean, I honestly, especially from a spiritual level and not killing others, I just, I'm going to borrow that if that's alright with you. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's, I think there are references um, within the Bible as well that you can go to. Um, yes? perspective. There's a whole room on uh, Veganic Growing. Um, I'd honestly spend the whole day there if I could um, around that. I think when we talk about um, discussions with others, it's kind of a step-by-step -step process to me. I mean, first thing is just ha opening up to being open to have the conversations because I think oftentimes they'll present themselves to us. We've talked a little bit about different communication strategies and not having that single interaction focus. But honestly, if anyone here gets, um, you know, is worried about um, having the same things and getting a bit bored with it, I encourage you to look into our communication. Or sorry, our language. Our language is such a profoundly robust, complex roller coaster ride, and I can give you specific examples maybe afterwards, so the next speaker can set up. 
But if you're interested in exploring that more, I encourage you to check out the Unlearning Species as Language um, group on Facebook. And it asks us questions like, you know, what's the non-speciesist alternative to animal products? People talk a lot about, I don't consume my animal products. Do we want to send the message that animals are a product? That's one of about 7,000 that swirls around on my head on a daily basis. I've got a language document on my website as well as a discussion guide um, if you'd like to check those out further. But hopefully that's a little uh, enough to leave it there. Um, any other quick cheeky thoughts so the next speaker has at least 10 minutes to set up? Yeah. Yeah, when people say uh, we care about animals but what about humans, I say well I don't eat humans either. <laughs> I like that. That's a good did everybody hear that? Yeah, okay. Cool. Oh, I think that's a great point to end this on, actually. Let's just leave it there. I also don't eat humans. <laughs> Honestly, thank you so much um, for coming today. Um, it really charges me up. I think for a lot of us, we think about or maybe even campaign on these issues on a regular basis. And it's just so nice to come to these places and know that we're not alone. There's others out there who want to respect others and their rights through veganism. So thank you. There you have it. There's my new talk designed for the Vegan Curious. The cool thing is I actually gave this talk earlier in the week to a local humanist group and my favorite part was after I did my talk, they fired questions at me for close to two hours and some of them were pretty deep philosophical questions. This is an entire new element to my advocacy that I'm really looking forward to expanding further and speaking at other groups like this locally. Do you want to miss out on a group of humanists firing questions at me for close to two hours? I didn't think so. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching and for free support for new vegans and free resources such as a discussion guide and language document, check out veganinteractions.com.